Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Amer AMIA edition of the March Ops Engineering Showcase. Uh, today, we have a uh, great discussion around uh, CICD uh, data time decay with uh, Drugorsh. So if you are ready, um, the floor is yours. I don't think I can hear you. Can, can yeah, you... and what about now? Yeah. Is it better? Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, so again, uh, hello everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about the CICD time decay initiative. And um, there is not like a lot of work done, so I cannot open GitLab and show you how it works. Uh, but I can, uh, I prepared some slides. I will present to you and, and then uh, I plan to talk through all the concepts and the ideas uh, behind the CICD time decay. So let me share my screen. Uh, yeah, can you, can you see my screen? Let me start screen. Uh, no, not this one. Slideshow. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, there is an uh, architecture evolution blueprint describing um, what the time decay is, why why we, do we need it, what it is all about. So you you can you can open the link um, in the agenda and you can then uh, read more about that. So so basically, uh, <clears throat> we we need the time decay. We need to implement that because uh, it seems that our CI/CD data growth is quite significant. As you can see um, on, on, this, on, the, on, the, on the screenshot, we've been, uh, we, we, we do experience a significant exponential growth in the, in the amount of builds, jobs, artifacts uh, being stored in uh, our PostgreSQL database. Uh, so uh, between 2013, since the inception of GitLab CI to February the last year, 2021, uh, we had seen 1 billion builds created on GitLab.com. And then it only took us another year, 12 months to create another billion builds. So right now we are at uh, 2 billion builds. And uh, this is a, a little bit outdated, but I think that today we probably uh, store more than 2 billion builds in our uh, PostgreSQL database. Like, it's a lot. And uh, <clears throat> with, with that pace of um, builds created mon uh, monthly on GitLab in, in February, actually, I should really refresh this, this graph because we would see data from February already. Uh, I think this was generated uh, two weeks ago, something like that. But um, I'm pretty sure that today we, we uh, see more than 100 million builds created on gitlab.com each, each, each month. So it means that we will probably uh, see another billion created in the 10 months. So that's not like, like a lot of time. And um, there are some forecasts. In, in Google spreadsheets, you, you have this really nice feature, which is called trend line, and, and you can see the trend uh, from your data points. This one, the, the blue one is the exponential. Uh, the green one is polynomial. Basically, uh, I think that what <clears throat> we are expecting is to see something in between them. So it means that uh, at the beginning of 2024, we'll probably uh, create more than 10 million builds uh, per day. So, so that, that's definitely a lot. And uh, to put that into a scale and make it uh, easier to reason about this number, I, I created this forecast for the cumulative cumulative builds created. So that's all the builds that are stored. This data is also a bit old, but basically uh, I think that right now we are at 2, two billion here. So that's uh, in, in billions, right? So. Uh, today we are somewhere here it's we know that we are at 2 billion and um probably by 2026 
we are at around 10 billion. So that's the forecast. Of course, it's difficult to predict the future and we might be completely wrong, but according to data that we have right now and some tools we can use to forecast, uh, you know, the 10 billion around 2026 seems like something that is actually feasible. So that's a lot. And we need to have a better infrastructure and uh, better tools to actually store all this data. And there are a few parallel work streams. As some of you know, we already work on CICD database, database decomposition, what means that we will uh, have two databases connected to our application on gitlab.com. Uh, there is going to be a main database and there's going to be a CI database. Uh, this will actually make it, this will actually double the write capacity. So that's why this effort is very important. And, and then we are working on CI CD scaling and we want to partition data. We want to implement the time decay pattern. So, um, uh, so part, data partitioning means that we take all the big database tables we have right now and we divide them into a smaller parts that smaller tables that that is data partitioning uh, we are going to use declarative postgresql partitioning that's a feature that the postgresql database has implemented and that we can use to partition data uh, ci decomposition means that we will extract some of the big tables to a separate database and we can partition them the, the those tables there or we can not do that and uh, i created this sim simple or it's not really simple this diagram to to uh guide you through the differences between partitioning and uh, data uh, decomposition mm. yeah and and perhaps i i uh try to explain more what the differences are between partitioning and the composition are there any questions uh, to you know what what i've said so far one of my questions and i guess it's just i think it's probably something that you'll uh, elaborate on and have already is with the expectations that we're trending towards with having the um, higher amount of builds um, you know, in our near future, it's, it's exciting, um, I will say, uh, because it shows that people are using the platform in a way that we have never seen before. Those, you know, numbers are indicative of that. Um, are there other concerns that you have um, just from a, um, from an accommodation standpoint that, that uh, are things that should be on our radar also, in addition to this stuff that you're also thinking about right now as well, Trevor? So that's, that's a great question. And, um... I think that in order to uh, be able to process uh, two, three hundred million builds uh, a month, we will definitely need to uh, change a lot of uh, uh, a lot of places in our code base. Definitely, we will need to re-architect uh, at least a bunch of features, and we will need to work proactively to do that before things start collapsing and breaking. But the prerequisite for that is to have a solid data storage model because uh, it all won't work if we are unable to write data and read data. So because database is a single point, point of failure, uh, actually after the decomposition, we'll have two separate points of failure. Um, you know, it's actually very important to have this storage model um, taken care of before we can proceed with uh, different architectural initiatives. So that's like the groundwork for the scaling because without having a solid database model and a storage layer, uh, everything doesn't matter because when database breaks, everything is broken. So that's the answer to your question. I know it's not very specific, but uh, like it, uh, just trying to highlight that database is the foundation. Like we need to fix that first when we before we can proceed with the different architectural initiatives. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and especially with a lot of our um, focus recently on some of those uh, DB initiatives, um, it uh, it kind of makes sense how this is 
snapping together for, you know, for our future. Um, I see there's a couple other questions uh, being added to Fabio. Do you want to verbalize your question? Yeah, I have two questions. So the first one is like, uh, what impacts do we expect with, you know, partitioning the CI tables and, and by applying the correct time decay strategy? What do we expect to happen in the application? Yeah, so <clears throat> that's a great question. And let me try to answer this question by talking about what is described on this diagram. So these are the out possible outcomes uh, of it, 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 you know, the diagram describes what may happen if we keep growing our data CICD data volume in time and uh, uh, how database can actually react uh, and scale as, as we grow, as the data volume grows and we either do nothing, which is the red line. So the red line is um, um, database performance if we do nothing. So at some point we will keep adding more data, we will keep adding more, more data and at some point we will experience an outage. Our transactions per second rate will drop to almost zero and it means like everything is broken. So uh, like we cannot add more data and more uh, transactions per second in, in differently. We can uh, vertically scale our primary database, but it has been done. Like right now we are probably using the most powerful machine we can, we can buy in a cloud environment or the second most powerful machine we can we can purchase in a cloud uh, environment in google cloud platform which means that we cannot really uh, depend on scaling vertically like buying bigger machines with more cpus with with more memory uh, at some point like that will not be enough and we will not be able to uh, keep writing to the database with, with that rate so because this is mostly about writes, because with with reads we do have replicas. There are some there's some overhead of adding more replicas, but there's some way to actually uh, add more read capacity. Uh, you can write only to a primary database. So at some point when we write too much, uh, the CPU will saturate, the memory will saturate, and basically we we will have an outage. What is describing here? But at some point, we can actually ship the composition, which means that we will uh, add more capacity because we will have a separate machine that will only store the CI CD data and uh, we will only write CI CD data to that machine. On that machine, we won't have a multitude of, multitude of other database tables, which means that there will be more uh, resources to uh, write and store on this ICT data, but this will only delay the inevitable uh, outage, uh, presumably by a couple of months, because the architecture will remain the same. We will still need to vacuum large tables. We will still need to maintain those large tables. And this this uh, actually just delay the in inevitable uh, problems, provided that, of course, we keep growing and we keep adding more writes and more writes and uh, more data and more data, more terabytes. Like today, there, there are tables that are more than, I think, 100 terabytes large or something like that. So it's like a lot of data per table. And when you store so so much data within a table, there there, there, is, there are some problems coming from internal PostgreSQL maintenance operations like out of vacuum running and trying to recalculate statistics for this table and stuff like that. So at, at some point we can either start partitioning in the uh, decomposed database or we can even ship partitioning in the non-decomposed -decom database. And this should actually make it much easier to write, read, and maintain CI/CD data because instead of having a table that is a hundred terabytes large, you will have uh, perhaps ten or twenty tables that are much smaller. And with the time decay implemented, we will presumably only have a few partitions that are being used and maintained by PostgreSQL. So all the other unused partitions will be basically just stored on the disk. We can then later even think about extracting this data to a different machine and, and stuff like that. So the outcome to answer your question, Fabio, 
the outcome of by partitioning should be that um, like it's partitioning and time time decay. These are very related concepts, but are kind of orthogonal in some way. And, uh, we want to implement time decay using partitioning, meaning that uh, we are going to archive data by archiving a partition. So it means that this data will be stored in the in this PostgreSQL database, but we will not write to that partition. We will not read from that partition. We will not cache data or indexes or anything uh, about this partition. So this unused partition will have a very small footprint of, you know, we will not have impact on memory resources, on, on the CPU resources. So the outcome is that we can add more partitions, archived all data, and PostgreSQL will be tasked with maintaining only a small subset of data. Uh, access to uh, old partitions will be restricted in some way. And uh, this will this should save a lot of resources because PostgreSQL won't need to, uh, you know, run vacuum processes for legacy or old partitions or archive partitions, and uh, uh, it will greatly improve efficiency of the internal mechanism of mechanisms of the PostgreSQL uh, to just take care of some small subset of data. Everything else will be just stored and not touched that much by PostgreSQL. Does that answer your question, Fabio? Yeah, so it, like in short, the, the stress we are feeling today is primarily with the database. Uh, whenever we see outage and CI, it's almost always related to the database writes or reads. Is that correct? Uh, not really. I think that there are many points of tension but with PostgreSQL, um, we clearly see that the, the amount of data is growing and, and the uh, tension will increase. In other parts we can, uh, of GitLab, we can, we can refine features, we can fix performance problems. We are experiencing these bottlenecks in other areas as well, like the Ruby codes. There are some uh, parts of the, our code base that are not very efficient. There are some performance bottlenecks, like for example, around variables and slow pipeline creation. But the slow pipeline creation right now does not really stem from inefficiencies in the database layer. It just stems from inefficiencies in our architecture and that uh, customers and users tend to create huge pipelines. So this is something that we will need to solve separately. It's not going to be solved by data partitioning, uh, but <clears throat> with database, because it's the foundation, like if database doesn't work, nothing works. Uh, we know that this is something that we need to start solving right now, because given our forecasts and uh, future predictions, we know that if we don't start doing that, definitely database will collapse. And in the meantime, in parallel, we are also resolving other deficiencies and bottlenecks. Uh, we usually have infra dev issues for, for them or other reliability issues. Um, but uh, yeah, database, it, it, it's kind of uh, this kind of thing that we know we still do have a couple of months to solve, but if we keep growing at this rate and everything says that we will still grow exponentially, uh, there will be a ceiling and we will need to uh, solve that before we hit it. Does that answer your question, Fabio? Yeah, yeah. It kind of connects me with, to the next question with uh, kind of partially answered. So, you know, our error budget, you know, can can have some kind of sensitive endpoints sometimes, as for example, the creation of pipeline. So I was wondering whether, you know, by looking at error budget, you know, what, is, what are the sensitive endpoints that we could start considering being, um, you know, focus points? Uh, you know, for example, if the, the, for example, the pipeline creation is what throws us across, you know, the, the, the error budget on the red side and like most of the, all the time, for example. And so we, we know these are kind of areas that we have to focus on or, and trying to understand what makes pipeline creation slow and kind of gives us some hints on what are the slow parts of our application, what are the, where we see mostly kind of scalability issues. Um, 
But I was, it was just like a curiosity question to see whether we have done any kind of analysis like that. Uh, so I think it's, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's kind of separate from the uh, database part of the yes. problem of the, of the growth. Uh, we have some visibility into which endpoints are slow and which endpoints can negatively affect our error budget. There are some endpoints, like uh, I think that's a part of the public API where you can try uh, attempt to find a job by name or reference or a status. And we know that this endpoint basically doesn't work because when you have 2 billion builds in the CI builds table, even if you use the, an index to filter by project, which you need to provide when you make an API request, we know that the, the index is just too large and we will always hit the statement timeout. So this problem particularly might be solved by uh, partitioning, mm -hmm. but there are other problems that are not solvable by just partitioning or decomposition. And uh, I think it, it might be a good idea to uh, use our observability tooling we have to enumerate them better. If we want to improve the error budget and if that's the goal, there's definitely uh, some room for improvement in the process of identifying such endpoints and uh, practically solving bottlenecks in there, even though if those bottlenecks are not really database related. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for great questions. Uh, so let, let, let me proceed with uh, this, this diagram. So this is basically a diagram that describes the pipeline data life cycle. And um, there are three areas we want to focus on um, um, while improving the database scalability and uh, moving data outside of database as well. So as, as you can see on the diagram, the left side is the pipeline authoring, and the x axis is at time. So at zero, we create a pipeline. <clears throat> so when we create a pipeline, like prior to creating a pipeline, of course, we need to build a YAML and experiment with that. Uh, let's say that it, 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 uh, the pipeline gets created at, at zero point on the x-axis. And, and uh, we clearly see that at the beginning, there is a lot of activity in accessing pipeline data. When you create a pipeline, you see that it failed. You are going to open your GitLab uh, project page. You are going to navigate to pipelines uh, page or merge request. You will find a pipeline and builds that failed. And uh, you know this, this happens frequently uh, at the beginning of a pipeline life. Uh, it, within 24 hours, we are committing to process all the builds that uh, have been created. Uh, uh, there, there is a business rule, rule that says that uh, a build cannot be really in the pending state for more than 24 hours. So this build queuing mechanism uh, had been a huge bottleneck. We kind of solved that recently. We shipped the new architecture of uh, builds queuing and uh, the performance improved there greatly. There is still some work that needs to be done. For example, we want to partition queuing tables. Today we are um, queuing builds for execution using PostgreSQL. That's kind of an anti-pattern. Sometimes people say that PostgreSQL is not a, a message queue and, and it should not be used for this purpose. But actually for us, it works quite well, given that we uh, ship partitioning of the queuing tables, there are some out of vacuum bottlenecks related to not partitioning queuing tables. So that's the initiative number one. Uh, so after the pipeline uh, is actually done, so all, all the builds have been picked, processed, uh, have their status, uh, you can still go to a pipeline and retry a build, whether it was successful or, or failed. And you can still go to the pipeline, inspect uh, builds, open build logs and stuff like that. But with time, it's less and less frequent, right? Sometimes when uh, in a, on, on project like GitLab, we create hundreds of pipelines per day. We are not really very concerned about pipelines that uh, were created 
two months ago or a year ago. We rarely care about them. We rarely look at them and, and, and all them on the, on the build blocks. So there's this very strong time decay characteristics, meaning that old pipelines and old builds are not being accessed that frequently. So we want to introduce a new mechanism at the point here, uh, at point number two on this diagram. Um, and this mechanism will allow us to mark pipelines as an archived. Um, so this will effectively implement the time decay pattern uh, because the archived pipeline can be stored in a different way. The archived builds cannot be searchable that much. You still need to be able to go to a merge request and see all the builds on a, on a pipeline graph in a merge request. But you perhaps don't need to go to an index page, pipeline index page or builds index page uh, to find this build from like three months ago, like using pagination or this uh, infinite scroll, you would need to scroll or paginate like a lot to find a build that was created three months ago, right? So <clears throat> with the archived builds and archive pipelines, we can uh, model access to them differently. And we can model the access to them in a way that we improve the efficiency of the storage and uh, it, we improve um, uh, like the cost of storage as well. So at some point we want to archive pipelines. And, and then, you know, when the pipeline is archived, we still want to make it available, but we can do that in a slightly different way with additional benefits of uh, storage cost, compute resources and stuff like that. So that's the whole point in the uh, data uh, uh, CI, CD data decay, time decay. And we want to use partitioning to implement that because we want to partition CIC data and say that, look, builds that <clears throat> were created six months ago uh, are in this partition and we can now mark this partition as archived. Meaning that the, in the API, we want uh, browse such partitions looking for a builds uh, like in this endpoint I mentioned earlier today, that you can use this endpoint to find builds for a specific branch or with a specific name. When a build is in an archived partition, you won't be able to find it until you use either a separate API or, or provide some more data so that we can easily identify this old partition and we can actually search, it, search through it for, for, for a user. Uh, and yeah, and that's, that is how data partitioning and data time decay patterns are connected. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the plan. So there is the CI-CD partitioning merge request I'm working on. You can, you can look at the initial version. It's not yet complete. <clears throat> there will be a bit more code in there, but uh, the most important parts are, are already in there. And that's it. Any questions? I think, Caleb, did you want to verbalize your question that you had? Yes, thank you. This has been fascinating. I'm wondering for our self-hosted customers who are scaling out their own CI, CD infrastructures, what resources exist to help them find bottlenecks that might be causing them to have slowness that they could resolve through scaling out some in some way or some other fix? <clears throat> yeah, so that's a great question. And um, we've been approached by a few customers that are experiencing problems. We do have a really great support team, of course, like you are working on the, on the support team. And uh, basically, we know that the big customers on premises uh, can use similar tools uh, like we are using on GitLab.com they do have access to Prometheus metrics. Uh, they can set up their Grafana uh, dashboard to see the most important metrics. They are also making use of logging and uh, Sentry-like tools to collect exceptions. So basically with some additional effort that they, they can use similar tools and techniques that we are using on GitLab.com. And uh, we, uh, 
I, recently I've been involved involved in helping two customers that were experiencing slowness related to build queuing. And they actually provided us with the SQL queries that are slow. And we immediately could see that these are the slow queries that we uh, had seen a couple of months ago before shipping this new architecture for build queuing based on the compo um, the normalized database tables. Marius is currently working on enabling, enabling this mechanism for default, but in the meantime, we managed to provide feature flags names to the customers. They toggled the feature flags and immediately the slowness went away. So we could actually solve that. <clears throat> by enabling this feature for them that is not enabled by default yet it, it will probably be enabled by default in the next in the next release uh, but uh, basically i think to answer your question again uh, customers and users can use similar tools that we are using on gitlab.com there are metrics uh, there are logs and um, they are already doing that they are providing us with uh, slow queries and uh, uh, and uh, yeah that's not your question. Thank you. Um, I guess the only other part would be, do we have anything, um, anything documented to basically say, if you're seeing this kind of behavior, it may be related to this component so that somebody can have that kind of link written out for them. <clears throat> so I don't, think that we do basically if there is something we could document document like this like if you are seeing these problems you can do this it means that this should be done by default and we should not really document that but we should just enable that mechanism by default so that it it, it solves a problem for everyone by default uh, so in, we've been doing uh, that and basically uh, if there is something that uh, improves performance it should be shipped by default and sometimes there is a slight delay between enabling things by uh, before between we ship things on gitlab.com and enable them by default but usually this time frame is too small to justify uh, documenting that it's usually a, a milestone to milestones with the pending build stable it had been uh, longer but um, that's a very uh, unique situation, actually, a major re-architecture. Does that answer your question, Caleb? Yes, thank you. Great. Um, thank you, Dredorsh, for doing all this. I mean, I, I think it's really exciting to kind of see the direction that we're going, uh, kind of the things that we've been doing uh, as well. Um, before we close, did anyone have any other uh, other questions uh, for Dragos? Right, everyone, uh, have a great uh, left of your Wednesday and look forward to chatting with you again soon and at the next month's showcase. Thank you. Thank you.